right, it's 5 o'clock. All rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. The Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Well, good evening. It's an honor for me to be here. If you can, join me uh, in prayer. We uh, cover, the, cover this meeting. Well, most gracious Heavenly Father, uh, Lord, I think it's proper as we begin this meeting tonight to invite you into this place. We recognize, dear Lord, that you are the almighty creator of heaven and earth, that you are the ruling sovereign over all that is. We know, dear Lord, through your word that you establish the governing authorities, and dear Lord, that you are the ruler in the hearts of men and women. And so, Father, we come here tonight to thank you for your wonderful bounty and blessing and provision for this town over the decades and years, years and decades and even centuries, dear Lord. We're so grateful for that. And so, Father, I just pray for um, the elected officials, dear Lord, that will be overseeing this meeting. I pray that you would uh, give them compassionate spirits, listening ears, and strong discernment. And I pray for your overshadowing upon the agenda tonight, dear Lord, that through the discussions and the conversations and maybe even the debates, dear Lord, um, that they would be respectful of one another, um, and dear Lord, that they would be honoring to you. And so I just pray over this agenda, dear Lord, um, that your will be done, might be for the betterment of this community and for your kingdom. So we just ask for the power of your spirit now, Lord, to join this meeting, and uh, you get the glory for it. And I pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hey, the first item on the agenda, presentations. Uh, the police department, introduction of a new officer, and appointment by the deputy chief. Uh, we will uh, we can wait until after the uh, other presentation uh, because we have one of the officers off on a call right now. So okay. If you don't mind. No. Nope. I'll hold that for a little bit. Um, SC Group on the Riverfront Commons. Uh, information will be provided. Yep. Presentation. Is that? Yeah. <laughs> All right, this will be a little a little funky because the computer is set up here. Um, so I'm going to be very close to all of you. Okay. <laughs> so while Kelly's getting that set up, I'll just do a quick introduction. Um, I'm Kathy Conway with Horizons Engineering. Kelly's with SE Group, and Mike is from NCIC. And um, we're here to talk about the Riverfront Commons, which is really about the development of a 7.2 acre parcel of land that was purchased by the town in 2021. Um, it's, it's down in the River District area of town. Um, in 2019, a plan New Hampshire Chirac was completed to develop concepts and you know one of the main themes that came out of that was that it was really important to keep this land for public benefit. Um, and, and so since, since then, the town has gone to work in developing and putting a plan into place. Um, this project's been locally supported with voter approval for some funds, business contributions, the selling of tax credits, which allowed the community to leverage NBRC and land and water conservation federal funds. So we had about a total of $1.44 million for the project. And then in 2020, when COVID hit and the economy turned upside down and prices and supply chain issues all started to come to be, um, we started to really take another closer look at the budget and the concepts. And um, some of the projects that Horizons has been bidding over the last year or two 
we have seen 20 to 50 percent increases in in some of the the material gas prices, contractor prices. So so what Kelly's really going to do with you is is review some of the concepts and you know the town's really going to need to make some choices based on things beyond all of our controls. So. That's kind of just a little bit of the background, and so I'll turn it over to Kelly and let her get into the, the details of the project. Thank you, Kathy. Kathy, um, actually, I'm wondering if I stand here and you're able to sure. push the slides forward. Yeah, I can do that. That would be helpful. And just hit enter. Just hit back to everybody. <laughs> in your face. <laughs> just hit enter. Is that? I uh, hit the forward. This right here. Yeah, one of those. Okay. Let's just play with buttons for a minute. Okay, I'm good. Yep. Forward. There we go. Hi, everyone. Again, my name is Kelly. I am with SE Group, a planning and design firm, and we've been working with Horizons and with SDA Architects on the Riverfront Project, uh, Commons Project. <coughs> So I'm going to talk a little bit about the project process and also walk you through the concept that we essentially came up with and estimated costs. Um, so the process overall took this four-step approach. So starting with project understanding, this is really what, is, what are the goals of the project? What are we doing here? Uh, step two was technical analysis, which is boots on the ground, on the site, what are we really dealing with with the built environment? What is actually here that we need to just kind of navigate during this design process? Uh, step three is engagement, and that was engagement with stakeholder groups, uh, the public, and also other informants who would come in and supply information that was really helpful. And then uh, step four ultimately ended up with the concept that you'll see today and cost. And I will note that, um, uh, yeah, I will note that two, three, and four somewhat become an iterative process and kind of uh, morph into each other and feed into each other through the design process. Go ahead, next slide. Um, so project understanding and goals. We were clear that there were three goals for this project. One, to support business and economic growth in the town of Littleton. Two, to provide open space and healthy recreational opportunities for residents and visitors. And three, was to include park elements from the Plant New Hampshire charrette design, uh, which Kathy alluded to before. And these are all of those elements. I'm just gonna go down them so we know what they are quickly. Uh, it is a welcome center and restrooms, parking lot to accommodate 40 to 50 cars, rail trail connector, lighting, performance and community area, stormwater facilities, and site landscaping. Hmm. Um, so to keep it brief, <laughs> I'm just going to go into some of the key takeaways from our technical analysis of the site itself. Um, this was a very layered uh, technical analysis, and this is these were the big things that stood out to us. Um, going from number one, at this entry, so we're Riverland Lane right here, coming into the park as it is today, and we initially noticed that when you arrive at the park, uh, it's a little confusing. You don't necessarily know where you are if you're a pedestrian. You don't know how or where to go if you're driving a car. You don't really know how or where to go. <coughs> Um, so just like unclear, unsafe circulation was the first thing. The ADA parking located out there right now is not, it doesn't meet code. Um, so that is another thing that we were very aware of. Um, the parking lot existing today lacks stormwater treatment before it discharges into the river. Um, and the parking lot itself does not meet the current needs. And that is roughly around 40 spaces. Um, there is also just lacking a sense of arrival, again, just like that overall, a little bit of confusion when you come <coughs> on the site itself, uh, as well as a prevalence of wetlands. It's a little hard to see on this graphic, but anything highlighted with an overlay of blue is a delineated wetlands. Um, also on site is a lot of topography. <laughs> As a landscape architect, I do really love dealing with topography, but when you get, you're trying to get from point A to point B quickly, it, it makes things a little challenging. So there is a lot of complex topography out there. 
Um, there's also that barn structure, and it's pretty underutilized as it is today. There are also federal and state regulations, mostly because we are in the riparian area. So shoreland buffers, we've got a FEMA flood plain, plain we're dealing with. We have local, state, federal regulations that we need to comply with in this location. Um, there's also this large intact canopy that we were dealing with and just aware of. Um, there is no direct river access. Um, there's a lot of desire lines and the indications of where people want to go in order to access the river, but no prescriptive way to do so. So that is something that we thought um, could increase, again, just going to, back to that goal of recreation. Um, there's also two pine trees, two mature pine trees out there on site, smack dab in the middle of where we were deciding, which is great. <laughs> <laughs> um, there is also, uh, slightly off this slide, um, there is a future potential parking opportunity, satellite parking with, can I talk about this? I assume so. You what? I can talk about this, right? The, oh, the potential lot? Yeah, yes. the board's aware of that. It'll go to a vote in March. But I yeah. figured you would yeah. flag me. <laughs> <laughs> That's that lot on the yeah. yeah. side. Right? Yeah. So Riverside Drive, there is this potential lot that is coming online. So this opens up a lot of opportunities. Um, and we can talk about that once we see the concept itself. Uh, existing rail trail connection does happen at the west end of the lot, or west end of the parcel itself. Um, there are also existing utilities throughout the site, so overhead electric, underground sewer, we have power, we have all sorts of things over and under in this parcel, which is, again, interesting to navigate. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, last and not least, the senior center, and we just wanted to be really aware of how uh, our concept impact them and just what their day-to-day -day looks like in order to uh, have a symbiotic relationship with the coming and going of what they're, they're doing in their program. So public and stakeholder engagement, again, this was massive, I think, the public survey, I think we had about 125 people respond, which is a very engaged community, we love to see that. Um, I, I'm not going to talk about all 125 responses, <laughs> but key trends that showed up during those surveys and during those conversations and during those events with the stakeholders and other people that we talked with throughout this process was uh, restrooms and a common area for the farmer's market are really the top priorities for Riverfront Commons. Riverfront Commons should remain as flexible as possible. So that indicated to us as designers that there are not going to be a lot of built uh, environmental things put into the landscape that needs to be navigated. Um, provide additional parking was something that also came up as well as providing safe pedestrian and vehicular circulation. <coughs> Physical and visual access to the river is also a priority, as is Riverfront Commons should maintain its natural look and feel. So again, just keeping those natural elements, keeping those natural materials is really important. Also important was that the open space should be located along the river. So this was a big one, just in terms of what the concept is suggesting. Um, also interesting was to hear that thoughts about both the barn and the pine trees, we had the full range. We had everything from hands off, don't touch it, I love it, to like burn it tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> so we really heard like the full gradient of all of those things. Uh, we also did hear that a welcome center is not a priority for this particular location. That does not indicate that it's not a, not a priority for the town, it just indicates that this maybe not the right location for it. Thanks. So with that, we will go into the concept design and cost. So again, going back to that budget, we're shooting for $920,000 total. That's what we had left and remaining from the $1.4 million. That number is bigger. We're aware of that. So this concept is Treat it as a master plan, and from this, I'll walk through a phase one opportunity that will keep us on budget for a phase one build. Um, so the biggest moves for this concept you'll see really is hinging on the fact that we are 
flipping the parking and the open space to again allow for that open space to be along the river. Um, and that. Which takes the barn down. It does take the barn okay. down, <laughs> which gets to I'm big like, no. Big where no. did you move? Did you move the barn somewhere? We tried. <laughs> I cannot tell you how many times I have tried to like pick the barn up, move it into a different location, and just trying to figure out cost estimates with it and what does it look like for a partial renovation, yeah. full renovation. Do we tear it down? What cost is that? Or, 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 and we honestly went back and forth up until like the midnight hour on the <laughs> barn itself. So yes, that brings us to big design move number two is that the barn is removed to allow for this parking area. Um, that was really a comment from the architect on the project. He essentially said, put your money in the park, not in the barn. So, okay. <laughs> Done. So I'll quickly walk through this design for you so you have an idea of what's happening here. Down River Glen Lane itself will remain as it stands today, as it is today, until you get to the senior center itself. And there will be a new park arrival and plaza coming down from the bridge as it exists today. So a set of stairs coming down into a little pedestrian plaza. The existing ramp will remain and we will directly connect to that. You'll see that there is also improved circulation, sidewalks directly connecting the community center to both the bridge access and this sidewalk and also the new parking lot. So again, keeping ADA to code is really that, that thought. Um, so sense of arrival moving into this new parking area. New parking area provides uh, 51 spaces, 10 of them ADA. Um, 10 is a lot for this area, but again, we want to be aware of who our neighbor is and provide for them as well. Um, and this is where conversations about the barn and the pine trees really come in. And we really thought that to blow out these pine trees and accommodate for more parking just didn't, it doesn't feel right. It feels nice to have a buffer between a parking lot and this overall event lawn, especially knowing that down the line you're gonna have the satellite parking area mm -hmm. uh, pretty accessible down in this west end. Um, so going down, you have an event lawn and event space that is roughly, it's a little bit larger. We're talking like 0 0.05 acres larger than the existing open space as it is today. Uh, with the pines, it does become a little bit larger than that even. Um, so we are thinking about events. Mobile stage will be out in this west end. Um, and again, this won't be a fixed feature in the landscape, it'll just be footings, so mobile stage footings. Um, and then from there, we actually increase the canopy cover itself to create a boundary, to kind of create this envelope, um, to keep that sense of space, sense of here, sense of there, when you're in the event lawn itself, because it is a pretty vast open area. Um, again, to hold an edge and hold a boundary, we added seat walls, and this is pretty much the only thing that's like a fixed element in that area. Um, and from there, we were able to kind of denote there's an open green space out there today that's largely mm -hmm. underused. Um, and it actually becomes this really sweet intimate area where you could add picnic tables, it could become a picnic lawn, something like that. In the future, it could be a great place for a playground, if that is something that the community needs. Um, but again, just kind of this more intimate gathering area. You'll see two river access opportunities. One, just like a stone step down to the river itself. And then the other, just a more informal gravel pathway. And then also, woodland paths. Again, really simple, four foot, crushed rock, very simple. Uh, through the canopy as it exists today. Again, as a way to just increase that sense of recreation opportunity, but also celebrate where people are. Kelly, on the, uh, yes. which path is the, the gravel path? This one going oh. through. Six. 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 Yeah, but number five here. Down to the river. Five as well. Five? Mm -hmm. So yep. that's the one that's going to be going down to the river. Yeah. Okay, because I'm, I'm just thinking it doesn't, um, where the Amnusic is a real flash, flooded, and yes. how long would those, that? 
We wow. have been told that everything gets very flashy around here. <clears throat> Pardon me. Um, so that is something where we're, we can set like larger stones and just kind of reinforce it as much as possible and okay. as need be. It may just be one of those things where you clear a little bit more of the vegetation in that prescriptive path alignment. And maybe it's nothing more than that. You do what you can to avoid erosion measures and erosion controls and work with horizons and things like that. Um, and just really be aware of where we are doing okay. this type of construction. Yeah. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, excuse me. So moving down the path, we do have a couple seating nodes. And again, very simple, just gravel surfacing, a couple benches, maybe a little information sign something like that, very informal. And then lighting throughout, so lighting along the existing walk itself. Um, some things you don't see in this design is a restroom, the welcome center, or a direct connection to the rail trail. So the welcome center, again, that was largely because of feedback from both the public and the stakeholder, stakeholder group saying, no, no, it doesn't belong here, so we listened. Restrooms, mostly because of maintenance and ops, really. Who's going to do what? Who's going to keep it safe? Who's going to keep it clean? Who's going to stock it? Who is going to, I mean, the police is here, so <laughs> we can have a conversation about public restrooms if you'd like. Um, but just all of those conversations about, is this the right time for this particular amenity to show up here? Um, and again, thinking about future conditions, these pine trees eventually will die off, which will provide a buffer area, and if there is eventually an opportunity to get a restroom pavilion in there, that is something that should come in the future. You can also put a, an informational kiosk there too, with mm -hmm. just because I've seen those in other towns in this type of a setup. Yep, exactly, exactly. Um, so to me, the remaining funding that we have right now, the $920,000, we are about $1,000 over. We will do our best to figure that out. <laughs> um, but this phase one, uh, phase one full build will deliver everything that you just heard me talk about in the overall idea of the master plan with these five omissions. So it, it's not that these things would never happen, it just wouldn't occur in phase one. Um, so lighting along the river path itself, given the price point of that, we were thinking that as an opportunity to be a standalone project or uh, fit in with a larger town lighting plan if one does come online. Uh, two and three, woodland paths and access path. So keep the stone steps down into the river itself, but maybe this path comes online a little bit later. And same with the woodland paths itself. And we did hear feedback from some of the stakeholders that the canopy and the shrub layer is really important. Mm -hmm. So maybe this isn't the opportunity or the place for a woodland path itself. So maybe that just disappears altogether and that's fine too. Uh, and also four is something that we think could happen at a later date and that's those uh, like rock gravity wall, sea walls. And then signage and rewinding as well. And we're thinking direct rail trail connection. This whole intersection right here is a future project. I mean, you're looking at how do we get to the rail trail from this existing walk? How do you get there from what will become a parking area? And what is signage and just like opportunities for safety measures in that location? Next. One of the questions I have is you're putting in a concert pavilion, a stage, temporary stage, you're going to do musical events and there will be drop a bunch of people with no restrooms. And yeah, we did have this conversation talking with the, the guys who are running the farmer's market right now and talking with the folks who are running the First Friday events and those types of things right now. The opportunity for temporary restrooms right now, there's a full gamut from uh, porta potty, like that blue green thing that you see everywhere, all the way up to something that's actually like reclaimed barn wood and trailers and air conditioning and all these things. So, our recommendation at this point, at this stage of the project, actually is to not invest the money into a full build restroom itself, but 
more so look at those more temporary opportunities. Okay. Again, thinking about uh, off-season water connection is a major concern. And also thinking about another future uh, item could be looking at the senior center itself and looking to see if there's an opportunity to put an addition onto it so you can stub it into their existing utilities and create a public restroom there. Again, that goes into a conversation about safety, maintenance, ops, all of that. So just following up on that, that some of the conversation, and I know since I've been here, is the, the issue of bathrooms. and. Yeah. We have none. And we have none, but there's only, you'll need them certain times. And so, versus building something permanent that yeah. ends up getting, I'll be honest, vandalized mm -hmm. and becomes a serious problem, that maybe as part of our events, we just factor in the cost of renting. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, like we said, everything from the, the portables to yeah. the trailers that are actually fairly decent. They have a ramp for ADA and, and lights and air conditioning or whatever. They can be locked up when the event's over. You know, but they would serve, you know, still that area in, in terms of there. Mm -hmm. And even, you know, broaching that out separate from here, you know, if there's that much of a demand downtown, you know, maybe even something smaller, you know, in one of the parking lots that we lease. Yeah, we'd lose a few spots, but if we put something up in there. But the same thing, it's, it's kind of seasonal. It's there to get us through the, the summer and the leafers. Yeah. And, and, but... It's something that's not 24-7, you know, available and open and what have you, but at least it provides that. If we go and build a permanent structure, you're kind of stuck with it. It's, you know, there's certain times of the year it's not going to be used, and then it is an issue on, you know, then is it a parks problem? Is it DPW? Is somebody going on Saturday and Sunday and locking it up, you know, stocking supplies and what have you? So there's, I mean, there's a lot of cost right. issues that are involved into a permanent, but we do recognize that around events There's you would need, need yeah you would need you know we would need something and I think that kind of maybe took us in the whole direction that it might be easier to spend money on seasonal than something permanent. What about like a, a composting type mm -hmm. of situation where they're they're porta potties but they're permanent composting which would eliminate the uh, need for water and to drain that in the in the winter time I, I mean I'm not I'm familiar enough with it but I know there it's high-tech now it is high-tech mm -hmm. it is very high-tech um, and that's something we can look into I would actually turn towards horizons just because again we are in that shoreland buffer we are within the floodplain so there is a concern about mm -hmm. contamination and waste human waste in those areas um, so I think we'd have to look at regulations and what we can and can't do specifically around uh, that type of program. Thank you. All right, Paul, so. You a question? Oh. I, I just have a comment because I know that you moved the lighting to maybe a phase two. Mm -hmm. But lighting, we've been asking for lighting, at least from a public safety standpoint, uh, ever since that river walk has been put in. Uh, it's, it's dark as a pocket in there during the, during the uh, summer when it's heavily utilized. And I don't know if you can do a, a phased approach to the lighting as far as minimal lighting in phase one when the parking lot, if that is approved and expanded on the uh, expansion parking by the metal footbridge by the current bridge, yeah. that that be part of that project to enhance the lighting to make it bigger or better. Yeah. But uh, any lighting, um, because that is an evacuation route as well for uh, mm -hmm. the event. Uh, if there's um, if there's a, any type of a, an issue that occurs down there, that's one of the evacuation routes to go down there. And they have part they have um, concerts that take place at night. Yep. Now you have a bunch of people running down a path that they can't see. Yep. So again, um, a crime prevention piece, but also it's also an evacuation route that's going to need to be lighted minimally at first, but something. Um, Kathy, could you go back one slide? Sure. Thank you for that. Um, so phase one, we are suggesting lighting in the parking lot, so this would be lit, as well as this new pedestrian plaza itself. And then when this lawn goes in, I don't see why we couldn't run conduit and start stubbing out for future, um, future lights. And this is kind of the part of the next steps. Uh, Kathy, if you want to go Well, I'm talking on. specifically the walkway that's currently oh. in place right now. Um, you, One of your plans was to, to light that whole walkway. Yes. 
to the Mount Curran Bridge. Yes. And so, uh, and you were going to move that to a different phase. And all I'm asking is that you consider some way to, to do something minimal right now as a public safety. Yeah. Yeah. I hear you. Thank you. All right. Next slide. And that goes into step one of next steps is really what are the elements that are involved in phase one. So the conversations like that are really important because that lets us know, okay, maybe this is involved and this isn't involved in phase one and it helps us prioritize. So thank you. Um, so after determining what elements are involved in this phase one bill, we then reconnect with funding groups that you like. And just re-engage that conversation again because a lot has happened since 2019 since funding has been was secured. And again, just hearing Kathy talk about or Kathy talk about the increase in costs and construction these days. I don't know how many of you are in the world of construction, but it is the wild west right now. Um, so next step after that is going into design and engineering development for phase one. We would then secure permits go into construction documentation, and then from there, go out to bid. From there, we would appoint a contractor uh, and start digging at the end of that. I'm hesitant to give a specific timeline to this right now, again, just given what the state of construction looks like. Um, but in general, this is a high-level look at the steps for the project. All right. I know that was a lot, I'm sorry, especially for these <laughs> <police. laughs> I'm just going to, Kelly, just ask Mike, not to put him on the spot, but just to weigh in a little bit on how this might impact what right. originally so, was the concept and funding. Kelly and Kathy did a really good job of kind of outlining what the original proposal was, which did include a welcome center and a labyrinth garden and then a connection to the rail trail, which was basically a line that got drew up that s steep slope to the railroad tracks, which would be very difficult to put in. The lighting, um, so there were a l are a lot of the components of this project that were included in the funding application, that there just isn't going to be enough funding to, to move forward with at this time. Um, we've had to provide uh, regular reports to all the funders, and so we've, we've kept them aware of the fact that Costs are escalating. Uh, there are components of the project that may not be feasible to move forward with, um, and that we may be looking for a revised scope and a revised budget. So we've let all the funders know that. Um, so hopefully soon after this meeting, if the board and the town can make some decisions about moving forward with this preferred option, we would go back to those funders and say, okay, now we've got a phase design. Here's what we're going to do in phase one with the $921,000 we've got left uh, and try to get their authorization to move forward with that. I think one of the big things to keep in mind is that one of the most important parts of this project was purchasing the land. Mm -hmm. And that has occurred and that was a long drawn out process mm -hmm. that a lot of people were involved in here. Uh, but you own it now and it's just a, I mean that was a huge component of this project, and that at least is taken care of. Now we need to uh, move forward with, you know, what makes sense to move forward with. So. Is there a plan in place too? Because I'm thinking um, you can't really do much construction in the winter time, and then we roll into spring, and then the farmers market starts, and how we can kind of navigate that, and also with the first Friday night um, concerts with construction going on and try, trying, <laughs> and there's, yeah. That one, that one will be tricky, especially, I mean, it really will depend on that sequence of next steps and when we go out to bid and what the bid environment looks like and when a contractor can first start construction. From there, we can be as mindful as we possibly can about the farmer's market schedule and sequence of events and also the first Friday events, mm. what's occurring around those, and we can try and maybe phase construction as we start digging and start installing. There are opportunities, it just might be a little janky for mm -hmm. one season. Mm -hmm. And I know I've spoken with the farmer's market guys, Eric and Tim, pretty extensively, and they are nervous about this, mm -hmm. which is understandable. Um, 
but really we are trying to do our best to be mindful of what their layout is, how it can fit in this new scheme, how they can access this site, and what the impacts will be, especially around those construction times. Okay. It is really unfortunate that farmers markets and construction happens at the same time. Yeah. Right? And, and with our with our contract documents, we can also you know put in there a sequencing or or phasing of the actual construction work so that there are areas available mm -hmm. um, to you know maybe, maybe the parking isn't right there for the whole season you know there's there's ways to to work around that with okay yeah it'll it's be awkward for a minute but hopefully, it will be hopefully yeah okay. there's unfortunately no way around construction can make a mess of things we're familiar yeah <laughs> yeah just one other point if i made too is that two of the funding sources their expiration dates are september of 2023 uh, and we already have extended deadlines mm -hmm. There may be a potential for extending a little bit further, but that would be iffy. So our goal really is for those two major sources to get that work done um, before September of next year so that we comply yeah. with those grant yeah. I'd really like to see us, too, um, kind of connecting with back around to what Roger said. You know, people are using the bathroom down there anyways, mm -hmm. but there's no formal bathrooms. Mm -hmm. We did so talk about I would just really like to see us come up with something, maybe. To yeah. I mean, we, we did have some discussions with the senior center, um, not going in, but an extension or whatever off, and, and there was a little concern, you know, even though be separate entrance and what have you. So, I mean, I'm trying to be real mindful of all the stakeholders down there, but probably would be, from a practical standpoint, the easier because of the plumbing and the mechanics and that's there, would almost be to build bathrooms off of that right. as, a, as a permanent site. Um, but um, may need to get the buy-in, you know, in terms of the, the building and the lease. The farmer's market folks, they were actually adamant, adamant about a not permanent structure. They prefer yeah. a portable solution. Yeah. I'm surprised by that. But. Yeah. Any other questions? I know that was a lot. It was you look at it and it's like it's a simple project, and then you get into the weeds on it and it's not simple. <laughs> <laughs> no, good job. Thank That's you. Good. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. And um, Jim has uh, my yeah. I was going to say so. maybe the, yeah. the the next step is I mean you know you're not making a a vote whatever tonight, no. yeah, but but we probably need to to get this on November December agenda to make mm -hmm. sure we've yeah. got some final direction just based on Mike said in terms of the timing yeah. um, and the funding yeah. source so that we go you know yeah. we go forward so we're not sitting here in April what to do yeah. Okay. Yeah. thank you everybody thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry, I want to thank Adam yeah. for thank kind of being the point person mm -hmm. on this for me. Yes. <laughs> 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 Okay, I guess we can go back to the police department, introduction of new officer. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, there's been a lot of changes at the police department recently, and I just wanted to bring you guys up to date and introduce you to some of the newer members. And uh, <clears throat> the, At some point during this year, we've had up to four vacancies at the police department, and if you've been reading in the news um, lately, you know, even the state police are down 70 troopers and they're offering $10,000 sign-on bonuses. So things have been very difficult uh, on the recruiting side. But even before we get into that, uh, when I was first hired, one of the bigger issues that we had within the department was a, a, an established succession plan. Um, you know, somebody would leave and everybody would be kind of doing this and saying, I don't know who's going to fill that person's position. And, and so we really started within the department developing uh, training programs 
so that everybody from officer level all the way up to uh, top tier command staff would know each other's jobs and would start being, we would develop uh, positions so that somebody could, when somebody left, we wouldn't be saying, well, who's going to do this next? We'd have somebody who could slide into that. So that's what we did. So, uh, Jim, if you'll stand up. Um, so for quite some years, we there was initial pushback, but we um, several years ago created a deputy chief's position. Uh, there was a reason for that, uh, certainly um, so that upon my departure, uh, there would be somebody that would definitely be qualified um, to fill in. Uh, there wouldn't be a void, and that uh, uh, the hope was that there would be acceptance within the community. Uh, so our first uh, stab at that obviously was with Deputy Chief Tyler. Uh, who served our community for many years, uh, 23 years, uh, and he recently retired. And so, um, knowing that he was going to retire, uh, we, um, we had been training uh, Jim Gardner to step up, and so uh, Jim has currently has uh, uh, 15 years on the job, uh, comes his father's chief of police, uh, he grew up locally in um, Carroll, Jefferson, Whitefield area. Uh, and uh, his father was chief in Carroll and in Lancaster. Uh, Jim is, uh, has a bachelor uh, degree in computer science. Uh, uh, has, he's married, has five children. Uh, uh, he is a DARE instructor, among other things, lead too good for drugs. Uh, he's really immersed himself in the community and he understands the operations of the, of the police department, but most importantly knows the people here. Uh, so, uh, about a month and a half ago, a little bit over a month and a half ago, maybe longer, uh, upon Deputy Chief Tyler's departure, I appointed uh, Jim to be our next mm -hmm. uh, Deputy Chief of Police. So, uh, if a lot of people don't know that out there in, in Channel 2 or for you, um, you know, uh, he's the perfect person for the job. And again, succession planning is important within an organization. That's exactly what we did. And there was absolutely no hesitation in my mind that this gentleman standing here uh, would be capable um, of filling not only Deputy Chief Tyler's job, but if I were to leave tomorrow, uh, you would be in good hands with him running this police department. And it's important that we have a Deputy Chief of Police as well for legal reasons. So when I'm not here, when I'm on vacation, he is a chief and he does have authority to make certain decisions upon my when I'm not around. So, Jim Gardner. So, Officer Roman and Officer Bergenlein, if you want to step up here, please. Um, so, uh, we did last year bring some officers forward that were hired, um, and uh, and one of those two of those individuals graduated the police academy recently. So, you're familiar with Officer Eastman and Officer Trapletti. Uh, but as I said, we've, we're, we've had the other vacancies, we're down to just one vacancy, so if anybody out there wants to be a police <laughs> officer and serve this great community, which is, by the way, we're recognized almost on the daily now about being a, just how outstanding the town of Littleton is, not only in the state of New Hampshire, but in New England. Um, but we hired two, uh, two officers recently. Uh, officer Bergeron uh, is, hails from the Lindenville, Vermont area. Uh, he's a veteran, just like uh, the deputy chief is. Uh, he uh, graduated with a bachelor's degree from Norwich University. Uh, he worked uh, for Norwich as security officer for a little while. Yes. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> and uh, we were lucky enough to snag him uh, as soon as uh, we had another hire, and he came on board and. Uh, uh, he and Officer Roman will be going to the police academy in um, January, and they're currently in field training. And uh, this is Officer uh, Maioli Roman. Uh, Maioli is a uh, certified nurse's assistant. Um, she comes from Worcester, Massachusetts, but was living in Berlin, correct? And she uh, is a corrections officer for the state. Uh, she was at the Berlin prison. Mm -hmm. We've allowed her to stay on part time uh, with uh, with the state while she's in training. Um, and 
Isn't she a black belt? She, I don't know if she's a black belt, <laughs> she's, but she, <laughs> she has two martial arts and uh, jiu-jitsu. Yeah. Jiu so, uh, you know, I think they're extremely well-rounded. We, you know, don't mess with uh, I think our, our community, community is going to be better off with these uh, officers, and we're really looking forward to working with them. And, um, you know, sending them off to the academy, off, obviously, is uh, something we're looking forward to as well. But, again, uh, Officer Bergeron and Officer Hope. That's it. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. <laughs>
and then we do pass on to, to seal. Right. So, I mean, we okay. can work, uh, you know, around that, but it, what they've done is they've already got the infrastructure in upstairs. So even if I took an office and wanted to make them into two, I can't change the air conditioning and the way it's right. done. And so right. it would almost then be putting a partition up just so much so far. Yeah. And, and by the time when, and actually the architects, the gentleman that, um, that was brought in on the SE group and, mm -hmm. and he gave the, the different, um, concepts on the bar so right. at least somebody familiar and stuff with it. so when we talked he said it kind of sounded like I was going to come in and we just throw out a sketch and make it easy but you know after he met with everybody and we walked it and came down he just said I'm, I'm going to be honest he said you know it, yeah. it's a much bigger project than than what was envisioned so let me yeah. just see what happens on Wednesday okay. and how we can um, um, we can work around that and the the other um, bit of, of news is um, as you know, a few months back, um, uh, Katie Williams left us, and I was able to split those duties um, between uh, two employees. Um, but it was also under the guise that it would be a, a temporary period, and, and one of the two is overwhelmed. Um, Lori is going to handle um, payroll and all, which is really the significant mm -hmm. aspect of that. So met today with um, Lori and with... Um, Cheryl, because I don't want to lose Cheryl. She's right. excellent at payables and mm. handling that. And so, you know, I want to stress somebody, you know, above and beyond. But so um, I've got a job description. I'm going to go ahead and try to um, hire part-time. Based on the money that we use from Katie, since not all of it was spent in, in dividing the job, even taking money back from the employee that took on those duties yeah. and the little bit of the savings that I had, mm -hmm. I'd still be able to fund a part-time position that, yeah, without the impacting the budget. I would still probably set it at 32 hours because I think it'd be easier to get somebody with some benefits involved mm -hmm. than, than not. Um, I have a candidate that some people are familiar with um, at office who has worked in municipal government, so there's at least an understanding of how mm -hmm. things operate. And I've got a meeting with her Wednesday based on how that meeting goes. Um, if doesn't go well, then I'll post and go from there. But, um, you know, Cheryl's going to work and help, you know, through a process. And uh, and I fully respect, you know, what she's done. And she just said, you know, she didn't believe it was as much as... Mm -hmm. And I said, well, welcome to my world. <laughs> 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 and so anyway, so that change will, will be coming. And, and, and so, again, that also adds to the office issue because then, you know... Um, Somebody squatted in that office yeah. now, so that's going to have an impact in terms of there. But, but I think we'll be able to do that without impacting. And and, and at least the, the the person we're talking with also has some experience in some other aspects of municipal. And so as the chief talks about looking ahead, I mean, Seal hasn't said she's going anywhere tomorrow, but this person also has welfare experience and some yeah. other things. So, you know, maybe if it starts out part time at 32 hours, depending on how things go, it might be able to involve. Yeah into a position um, in, in terms of that. So um, those are my two updates. Good. Okay. Thank you, Jim. All right. Thank you. I guess the only question I have as we're preparing the budget too, we'll have to roll it yeah. into... Yeah, okay. I mean, yeah. Laura yeah. and I were talking and, and that'll be adjusted, but it shouldn't change the numbers that have been... Okay. The number right. will be yeah. the same, which is distributed differently. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. Because you didn't take all of what she was getting not she in the current, anyway, not in the current right? budget yeah, Currently, you know, yeah. Right? if i took that whole position i didn't divide it 50 50 right I mean, held some out yeah and, and because i'm granted they were compensated for taking on those jobs yeah um and and cheryl knows i mean you know so yeah. i'll use that and then the portion of the savings i had from from Katie. Okay. so it should be a net yeah equal so it should see a change on the budget okay okay um Anything under the old business? Don't see anything. And I don't have anything right off the top. Nothing? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, so we're to the new business. Uh, so the new union contract uh, for the fire department. Um, it's up for discussion. Yeah, I'll just give you the quick highlight. Okay. Um, Yep. And as you well, as you all know, all the 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 departments, I say the departments, um, the union divisions that we have, 
um, highway transfer, police, and fire were all up this year. And last year we were only able to do a one year um, with fire and highway and, and transfer stations. So the, the, the goal is a couple of goals. One is is you keep the, the taxpayer in mind and, and you try to be cognizant of the impact um, on the taxpayer. The other is, is also providing some labor certainty you know, for the town and also some budgeting and financial um, certainty. Um, the challenge was um, trying to get police and fire to not be in the same year. Mm -hmm. And um, so what was able to do was to negotiate a four-year agreement with the, um, the fire department um, that over the four-year period averages out to a 5.7% increase. Um, and if approved by the board and, and the voters, um, uh, that would mean we wouldn't have to renegotiate until 2027 in um, reference to the, the, the fire department. Um, the cost in the first year um, is 54206 <coughs> and that would be from April 1st of 2023 till December of 2023. So in the agreement is 20.27% over four years. Yes, which averages out to 5.7. Yeah. Mm -hmm. With the, the biggest increase being in the in, in year one, which is 8.67, and then um, year two, 2.5, and then year three and four, 4.55. And um, while well, none of us, we hope inflation doesn't stick, you know, where it's at, but at least each year it does go down and involving all of these. So the, the most expensive year is going to be year 2023. And then after that, we'll, knowing if they're passed, mm -hmm. yeah. we'll know percentage wise from a budgeting standpoint, you know, we know what number to plug in. So we're right. have, and, and I will say this, I know it, it, maybe it's an odd way to put it, but you know, when we go through the, the, the budget later in the, in the, in the report and you see where we're at on legal, um, there will, well, we can look at this line item and say, but, but if we are able to approve the three years and the four years, um, other than some labor issues that come up on occasion, but very, very minor, there'll be some significant savings in legal mm -hmm. costs. I mean, and so right. we can look at it in a sense and saying, okay, you come to an impasse and you impose a, a, a budget or a, a, a contract on them, but then we're going to sit down with all the groups and negotiate and whatever again next year. And so there's a point in time where I can look at and say what we might spend in legal could almost pay for one of the years right. of, of the increases. Right. Um, so, I mean, it's not ideal. Uh, nobody wants to pay more than, than what's there. But uh, uh, we also, unfortunately, um, probably had the worst year we could ask for to have to negotiate contracts mm -hmm. when we're at a 40 year high, you know, we haven't seen inflation like this since the, yeah. 19, you know, the mid eighties. Um, you know, I remember my first house was 13.85% mortgage rate. <laughs> so seven <laughs> looks good. Right? <laughs> so anyway, I, I mean, I, there's never a perfect answer uh, in, in, in terms of that process, but I, I think long term when we look at all three of them collectively and over time, I, I think that they provide us labor certainty, um, maybe helps in retention and, and, and turnover because we've addressed you know, some of those issues. And at the same time, I think it will save us money in, in, in turnover and cost because mm -hmm. it costs you more to replace people and add them right. on as they're saying here, sending people to academies and what have you. And again, just looking at what we've spent in legal in the last year and a half and, and, and uh, probably still getting a couple of bills to come in maybe from the, the labor side because they don't always happen right away. I mean, in terms of that, I, I think there can be justified in the sense that some of this will pay for itself by not having those legal expenses mm -hmm. over the next three and four years. Any other? No, I just, <clears throat> I think for me, my biggest concern, I expressed it um, to Jim and to the and the other selectmen, that because we are in such a sensitive time financially, that it may mean, and it's very important that we compensate uh, those that do put their life on the line and that are out there. You know, I think of even the guys out two, three o'clock in the morning 
plowing mm. so that we have the roads right. ready and so and yet so we want to be able to be extremely fair with that on the other hand we don't want to have such a um, bad tax impact because there will be some individuals elderly we know that the um, those on social security will end up getting what an 8.7 something increase yeah, six, 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 yeah. six, but it's still for some of them it's still below poverty level and i i am sensitive to that too but i do believe that we have to compensate um, our for fire department our police department and um those that work in the highway and the transfer station. So are we are we needing to vote on these individually? I think we should. <clears throat> yeah, sure. yeah, yeah. And okay. Not, well, mayor, cause I, I mean, I haven't done these other than the one we had last year, so I, right. I did them as individual. <clears throat> yeah. I mean, just because each one of you sat on a different committee and did a process, so, you know, there yeah. may be some comments from, you know, like, you know, for example, like on the fire carry, you didn't you know, sit on that one. Um, Roger did, and then just just based on philosophical reasons, felt it was best he stepped back, and, and Linda kind of helped on the, the, the final process. So I, I split them into threes, you know, mm -hmm. just to the fact that, because uh, yeah. I, I think that's how they'll go to the voters. Yeah, they will. As, as There'll be three the separate articles. Three articles. Yeah. 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 And, yeah. And as you know, I mean, we're still in the, in the budget committee process, and depending on how the vote goes tonight on there, you know, I mean, we're still working on massaging numbers and, and where we're at this year. And so, again, looking to try to have as minimal impact mm -hmm. on the overall budget next year. So while there might be a little bit of a cost increase in terms of personnel, um, at least I can say from a general fund standpoint, there won't be worn articles, you know, because right. we're going to use uh, ARPA and the... Um, the state money that we got from the right. gas, you know, and those items, and there could even be some opportunity just based on, I know as the year ends and you have savings, it goes into reserves, but like we talked maybe about just using one-time payments, you know, mm -hmm. to just cover some costs so mm -hmm. that, you know, because we're actually, reserves turned out to be much healthier than what mm -hmm. they were when we started out a year ago, so even if we took... Mm -hmm. You know, money out of reserves and said, okay, $200,000, we could potentially end up with a no tax increase or mm -hmm. the same millage, which would be mm -hmm. ideal and in, in considering the inflation. Year Absolutely. That That's what, exactly what I'd like <clears throat> for us to go for. Okay. I, one yeah. thing One thing I want to say, Carrie um, mentioned the fact Social Security, both my husband and I are on Social Security. And while the numbers make me pause upon occasion, it's, I know what these guys do when they lay their lives on the line every day, including the DPW, because they are out there in the middle of the night. And, you know, um, it causes me to pause, but I think they deserve it. And I think we need to do it for them. Yeah, like I said, it's, uh, you know, I'd, I'd, you, you it's look, a tough year all the way it around. It is a tough year yeah, all the yeah, way around, yeah, but yeah. it's like, you know, we're on, if you, if you want to use the term fixed income, fine. I kind of disagree with that because everybody's on a fixed income. Um, but I just, I find that if you put things into perspective, it's easier to handle. And, and, and again, going and, back to what, you know, I said to the, to yeah. the vice chair, I mean, we know this going through the budget process right. and, and, you know, we've got many meetings coming up and, you know, and some numbers shift, you know, based on yeah. some priorities and, and, Again, as we get closer to the end of the year and we see how we, we end, you know, it may be, yes, I mean, it does go over into your reserve, but I think there's, you know, I'm reluctant yeah. to use reserves, but there are times when, you, when you need you're facing to. a year yeah. like this, it's different. Yeah. That you can kind of maybe say, okay, this is a one-time thing that we're right. going to do this, you know, to stabilize as we get through that process, right. and I think we'll be in a position to do that. Yeah, and yeah. I'm concerned, too, about sustainability. I mean, it's great that we can use some ARPA funds um, coming into yeah. this year. What about the next yeah. year yeah. and the next yeah. year? Yeah. Well, I don't think we're going to see much relief anytime too soon. No, no, I, and I agree with you. And I think, you know, and we as we go through these, you do see then the cost drops. So we were aware right. of what's that cost. So I can almost, I mean, kind of now sit down with Lori and say, okay, what's year two going to cost us, right. what's three year going to cost us, so we kind of know that if, if this passes, 
not only here tonight, but by the citizens. Well, the vote, I was going to say the voters have to. Yeah, no, no, the, the voters would do, but at least we would know, so at least right. we, we'd kind of know what that cap is. It's just like when you allowed us to lock in those rates with Primex in reference yep. to our mm -hmm. workers' comp and our liability. We know it wasn't going to go above a certain percent, so right. it, it does add some budget certainty. Yeah. Um, and you are right. I mean, meaning, you know, it's not like next year everything's right. going to be great. I mean, we could be completely the reverse of the other thing. You know, prices crash and we're in a recession and, and you know, <laughs> but we're kind of in uncharted territory. And I can tell you in my years of budgeting, I haven't had to deal with a year mm. with this kind like of inflation. This, yeah. I mean, the last time was the, the 80s, okay? And I wasn't doing this in the, uh, in the 80s. So, and, and doing three, you know, unions at the same time, you know, it's, it's what Carrie had said. It's that balance of knowing the impact on the community because that's the, the person who pays our bills, you right. know, uh, they're our customer. But these also are the people providing them those public safety services. Mm -hmm. and, and there is a part of them feeling that you understand yeah. the, the struggles yeah. they're going through and we recognize that. And, and I know there's no perfect answer, but you know, we're just doing what we can. I mean, I know right now the budget we've presented, not counting the labor costs, um, is about as flat as can be. As we can get um, it, yeah. And, uh, and like I said, I think with, with uh, her and I working, um, we can come up with some scenarios that I think can get us down to the point to where um, maybe we got, knock on wood, an opportunity of if the mill stayed the same, yeah. at least in, in, in a year when we had this kind of inflation and, and other entities are raising rates. You know, if we can do that, then I'm going to consider it a, a pretty successful year. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Okay, my turn. Yes, sir. So, figuring with the three <coughs> union contracts, we're adding $142,401 extra in payroll with the raises coming out of those three contracts. I think everybody's paid pretty fairly. They have a pretty good benefit program. Um, the fire department contract that I backed out of, either one of those was adding overtime to the $100,000 we already have this year in overtime. And I couldn't put my name on adding any more overtime to what the people are already saddled with. So, um, I can't put my name on any of these contracts to approve them. Just to let you know. Thank you yeah. for sharing that, mm -hmm. Roger. Oh, and so you and I have, have talked, and, yep. I, and, and, you're right. and like I said, it, it's business, it's not personal, and hopefully, no, it's business. and you know, even those on the other side of that don't look at it as it either, okay? I mean, it, you, yep. you, you're elected to make decisions, and, and, and sometimes they're not easy decisions, okay? Well, and, and you know, Roger's defense, he has been one that has... Uh, really taking a close look at the numbers, and and I appreciate that. Um, I'm not a numbers person, um, so I, in Roger's defense too, I appreciate that he has dogged that. And, and um, I can tell you that every two weeks. <laughs> <laughs> and that I respect um, where you're coming from, Roger. Yeah. Thank you. Just to let the people know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, no, no. Yeah. No. So I will make that motion. Um, I'll start with the contracts for the fire department. Mm -hmm. Make the motion to approve the contract or the union contract. I'll second that. All, right. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All those opposed? Aye. So now I'm looking for one on the uh, police department. Approval of that contract. We have a motion. I'll make that motion to approve the police department contract, union contract. I'll second that. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All those opposed? Aye. Now on the contract for the DPW transfer station. Uh, do I have a motion? I'll make that motion to I'll approve. I'll second it. All right. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All those opposed? Aye. Okay. Next. 
We have a board of selectmen's topics. Um, are you good? Oh, no, we, the expense. The expense thing from Jen. Oh, that's right. Sorry. Yeah, no, General right. expense. Yeah. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Um, as of September 30th, um, everything was on track. There'd be 25% of the budget left because we're 75% um, yeah. into the year. Right. Um, and we're currently 4.03% under budget. Um, so the uh, general fund has 29.03% to spend. That doesn't mean you spend it, but it's, you know, it's there. that's it's the there. difference between right. the 25 and, and the other. Um, I've highlighted, again, the, the couple of the, of, of the departments that are there and um, uh, the reason uh, into those. Um, and uh, actually, I've got cemeteries on here. I mean, it, it's over on paper, but it's not. And again, it's one of those mm -hmm. timing issues. Right. Yeah. Um, but the others, um, you know, we um, got a new t uh, town clerk, and there were some um, uh, 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 three elections and uh, some capital equipment in terms of laptop that had not been planned for for the supervisor, the checklist, and things that just weren't budgeted for. And, and I think our elections i got to make sure that they're sound integrity and that they've got the equipment and whatever they needed. So, mm -hmm. um, and, and I, I think, you know, we won't see that issue um, going into next year. I think anytime someone comes in and they inherit a budget, there's always some issues that happen in terms of their um, finance. That's kind of directly related to the number of um, audits and how those bills fell, you mm -hmm. know, for the 20 and the 21. Yep. That's true. Yeah. And legal, <laughs> this is the one that, you know, it's negative 43, you know, uh, um, percent. And let me just get my, you know, back up. Um, we had budgeted um, 132,500 and we have spent 190,000. Um, mm -hmm. Forty nine twenty seven, um, both legal in reference to our general legal and our collective bargaining, and this will give you an example. Um, collective bargaining, I budgeted at twenty two five, knowing the negotiations were coming up, and we spent thirty seven thousand two eighty. Um, so maybe another bill or two to come in and and again roger i know maybe it doesn't sell it that way and i'm not trying yeah, to, yeah. to buy you into it but but if i know that number is going to drop down to five thousand dollars next year i mean that's some savings are um to yeah they're regulating or they're passing they're, yeah they're, franconia they're, just the most recent yeah. yes and then whitefield um board deny short-term rental permits so i'm thinking you know we've been very blessed here in littleton that at one point, I think Milt um, surmised that we might have like 100 short-term rentals, but I think that was back two years ago. The biggest concern, too, for a lot of these other towns is that it's taken away housing um, right. for the local people. But I just want to keep us, I, I want to stay ahead of it. Um, we have been very fortunate that we haven't had um, the issues, and I say that, but maybe Chief... Um, chime in but we haven't we haven't we haven't had complaints as the board of selectmen i haven't you had haven't a, gotten yeah, a phone not a single call about that i don't know chief of, of any particular I, ongoing issues no i i would if if that's the issue then i, I think they'd have to come forward and say we would have been uh, providing this um short-term rental to long-term and these are the reasons why but i but from a police standpoint, we're not having excess issues. No, we're not issues. having any problems. Mm -hmm. And um, as a matter of fact, probably our, our focus is more on established um, motels. So. Okay. All right. Good. Thank you. So I just, and it's really nothing other than that. It's just because the just it is all thing. around us. Yeah. And I had heard, too, that there was a petition um, being generated, and they had asked us as a board to sign that petition. So, I, I haven't seen that. I, I do know um, we were notified last year um, and there was two agencies, one proposing 
um, regulating and then you know the the industry is <coughs> not regulating and I think I shared with you um, Madam uh, Vice Chair um, that uh, uh, I'm going to use Florida as an example only because the, it's the same issues that the country is seeing is so many of them are propping up that different cities and towns and counties started passing their own regulations and mm -hmm. so you had some that absolutely restricted and there were others mm -hmm. and so the state finally got involved and said no local regulations it's coming from Tallahassee so mm -hmm. that way a property owner who might own properties in two different counties or two different cities didn't have to worry same, about different right. rules and regulations and I know <laughs> And I don't know where it's back, and maybe that'll be before you after November <laughs> when you're our senator, um, that um, there may be a bill out there in dealing with that. And I think well, from what I've read, it was kind of similar to Florida's. It mm. was almost like giving a little bit more state regulation. Yeah. And, and what Florida's concern was is because they have a, the hotel motel tax, yeah. was just ensuring that they had to register. So therefore, they had to pay that that motel hotel tax. Um, but yeah, you had areas down there where half neighborhoods had gone to Airbnbs or VRBOs and college kids come in and there'd be 20 of them in a house, mm, and, you yeah. know, and major parties and stuff going on. So I, I get where those problems can come from, and I just hadn't seen that yet here. I mean, but, but I do know from the housing studies that have been done that that has had a serious impact. Mm, but yeah. on the other side of that, if you're a property owner, it's your property and it's like I can make this much or I can make this much it's like where do we get involved in that yeah. you know, yeah. in terms of property rights but yeah. again if we start seeing a problem and they start getting calls and you know we get you know complaints of noise and trash and, and, and whatever out of hand uh, we've at least got that opportunity unless the state steps in with an over regulation so we can stay aware Right. Did you want to say something? Yeah, I was just going to say from the fire marshal standpoint for the state of New Hampshire, one of the things that came up with that with the short term rentals was having 20 to 30 people in a, in a single family home. Um, and the kind of, if you will, the, the, um, the solution that they came up with was from a public safety standpoint, if there is an issue with one of these residents and stuff, that is the fire chief I can enter doing an inspection, but it's limited for that single family home to make sure they have working smoke detectors and carbon monoxide detectors without getting into any other, if you will, inspections that we consider a hotel. hotel. So there is an avenue there for our public safety for inspection if problems do develop, mm. but that's one of the things they did at the state level. So I just wanted to bring that to your Good. attention as well, too, that there's a mechanism there, first to make sure it is safe for anybody that's in there so that they do have a means of being alerted if the house catches fire or there's a carbon monoxide problem. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Being to step on your toes, ma'am. It's okay. <laughs> okay. It was good. Okay. Added, added to the discussion. Yeah, I just I wanted to, to thank the chief and the and the, the firemen who presented last had their parade the week before and then last Saturday was their open house. Seeing those kids down there with the firefighters, it was really, really cool. And the fire was it the fire marshal from the state had his dog there yes. as well. And uh, I think they, they did a really good job. I think it was a fun time. Was it a Dalmatian? No. Oh. It, was a ye it was a yellow lab. <laughs> okay. Very, very friendly yellow lab. Um, but also, the soccer game Saturday night was very entertaining. <laughs> and let me say publicly now that I've said to so many <laughs> in private that they really should have given um, the larger goal for the fire department to aim at. <laughs> or at least have a runner for the balls. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay, I have a I'm just glad I came back and heard no injuries. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so I look forward to I look forward to the one next year too. <laughs> um, I have a question for Chief McQuillan. Last Friday we sent a crew to Pittsburgh to cover their station for a day with our new engine. Yes. Any reason we couldn't have taken the old Boston engine, why we had to take our new one? Yeah, the reason for that, that was my decision to make, um, just because we have a mechanical problem with the Boston engine with the drive box on it where there's a leak with that, um, where my concern was that that failed as it was in route up there, which was going to be quite a tow feed to bring that back. 
We're currently working with uh, McDevitt and Allegiance to see what the, the, to replace that steering box. It's, it's quite expensive. It's a couple thousand dollars. I'm hoping it's a box that we can rebuild. Uh, but because of that, just keeping it local, if there was something to develop with that truck, I could walk it back to the station and stuff and keep it there to actually do repairs on it as opposed to have it, to have it towed from a distance away. All right. I just, to me, it seems strange to go two hours away to cover a station mm -hmm. in a different county. Yep. Um, I just wanted to know why, why we did it. It was a request that was made because I didn't have any good to cover at that point in time, so I agreed to do it because we had companies that have come in and covered us for the last couple years that we've had funerals in town for our duty crew to be able to attend those funerals for our call firefighter and the most recent one being Jeff what comes passing. Um, so it's, it, for me, it's no different than if there was a request for a response down to Keene as part of a mutual aid request. It's what we do. Um, we're, we're on the state mobilization plan. That's how it's utilized. Um, and we're able to, if you will, get a crew together and also be able to cover our town, which is something that a lot of other departments can't do, which is why they didn't have anybody that was available that day. So uh, all the other places, uh, Stewartstown, Coldbrook, all those places couldn't ended up being us because they are a volunteer fire department and we're the only full-time department that's why we have to do this. No, it was because that particular day that was the day that we were available to do it. They did have Berlin go up there to cover, they did have other towns that were covered, but they also had those departments that were friends or at least knew that colleague that were attending the funeral so they were unable to do it. Okay, thank you. Anything else? I don't have anything mm -hmm. else. No. Okay. So the next thing on the agenda would be the public comments. Um, do you want to read that? You want me to read it? Yep. You got it. Go ahead. Um, the question. The question was posed: Does the board have to allow public comment at meetings? A, in most cases, no. The only time public comment is required is during a public hearing when parties whose rights may be affected have the right to be heard. For example, if the board conducts a, conducts a public hearing, as we did our last meeting, for the layout of a new public road, the owners of the road over which the, the road will pass have a right to be heard. Um, when the selectmen hold a public hearing to consider buying or selling land or accept, accepting unanticipated grants, any member of the public who wishes to speak should be allowed to do so, which we have no problem with that. In contrast, the general public has no right to speak at any ordinary selectman's meeting. Meetings must be open to the public, but the right to attend is not the same thing as the right to speak. RSA 91A2, unless the board decides otherwise, the only people who may speak at a selectman's meeting are the board members and other people invited or permitted to speak by the board. If the public comment is permitted, the First Amendment right to free speech may be triggered. For more information on the subject, please see Public Meetings and Freedom of Speech, When Do Citizens Have a Right to Speak, published in March of 2009 in New Hampshire Town and Country Magazine. And we have allowed um, public comment, and we've allowed, we've made it a policy to allow about three minutes Yep, on one topic. On one topic. Yep. But we also request that anybody who does speak is respectful and not combative. And we will, we, if we do not have an answer, we will get an answer for you. Correct. So with that being said, any public comments? Rudy? Yeah. On uh, Walk, basic one, how much is the you know, how much you're going to be spent to complete that phase one. I know that the lady, the younger lady said nine, they got $921,000. Right. That's already, already here. We already have okay. that money. Okay. That's, with that $921,000, yeah. you're going to, yeah. she's going to complete that phase one. That's it. Or it's going to cost more? Not sure yet. You are, you are not sure? We're going to let them go through the phases of what's the best, get the plan together, 
Oh, you mean the complete, the complete? The, Go from there. The, the complete. Uh, It'll be brought uh, to the middle project. of the board. Yep. That Each is, phase of the project. It's different, right? Each phase of the project. Each is phase different is different. And the amount of money that they spend, right? Yep. I mean. I mean, faces are they for, right? You said. So I think, could I interrupt yeah, for a second? This is just strictly a public comments section. So it, I'm, we, I'm talking about money. I'm not talking about. We appreciate, Rudy, you asking the questions. It's strictly public comments. We're not here tonight to answer those questions. Sure. We can we can write it down, but we're not here to answer those. It's strictly public comments, not public questions public comments and that's what Linda just got done reading yeah, it's public like time, public like comments so what do you want the public to ask you guys what do you want what do you want the public the tax you pay to ask you guys just you know enlighten me tell me we're still not going to buy the bait um, Rudy, that you're trying to draw us into this. These are public comments. And with, there's a time and a place for question and answers. Delivery session. Exactly. Or pride, but it, this section is strictly public comments. So we can, you're welcome to go to the town office, maybe get some more information if you want, but just comments. That's it. Okay. Okay, in regard to the short term rental, I have a couple emails, I have, you know, uh, people to talk to you guys about the, but you already knew because you receive, a, you know, the label from these people. The only time that give you trouble for the short term rental is a battle. Nobody else. You guys got to know that short-term short rental is for traveling nurses or people that come over here to do a job for two days, three days, a week, a month. It's it. You know, they cannot go in the hotel for a short-term rental because it would have cost them a lot of money. That's why they need you guys' approval to you know, that it's not that you brought it to have a short, you know, short term rental. So thank you for your comment. Yeah. Appreciate that, Rudy. Yeah. Thank you. And uh, I also want to thank you, Rogers, you know, to stand with the taxpayer. I'm really, I'm, you know, I, not just me, the town. You really appreciate it. And you're going to see your name in the paper. No worry about that. You know. Okay. Hey. We're all set. Three minutes on it. Public comments, so um, you need a motion to adjourn the meeting? I can do that. I make a motion to adjourn. Okay. I'll second that. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Uh, next to the